This is the Beyond Take Two podcast brought to you by Beyond Hollywood International Film Festival. I am your host, Madge, and unfortunately, Veronica is under the weather, so she cannot join us today. Get well soon, Veronica. Uh, But we do have a special, 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 special guest (laughs) in the building with us. Um, This man was a finalist. Uh, for the Beyond Hollywood International Film Festival for uh, Best Documentary for his film, Reimagining Safety. Um, he is here today. He's going to tell us a little bit about his story, uh, talk a little bit about his film, and we are happy to have him. Mr. Matthew Solomon is in the building today. Thank you. How you doing, Matthew? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to be here. Man, definitely, definitely, definitely. Glad you was able to come through. Um, you know, we're going to get right into it. But first, we have our Buttered Up segment. Uh, today, uh, we have Smart Foods uh, Cool Ranch Dorito brand. So, you want to, okay. you, you know, take the reins. Uh, today's Buttered Up segment is brought to you by nobody. But, <laughs> unf- <laughs> but if you do... I uh, want to sponsor our Buttered Up segment. Uh, please send us an email at beyondtake2 at gmail.com. All right. All right so we got the Smart Food Cool Ranch. All right. I'm going to change it. Give him a little a- 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 ASMR. Yeah, <laughs> That's good. You like it? Yeah, it's good. All right. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Tasty. <laughs> Let's see. What do a, do a commercial for them. Right. Yeah. Right. Got a little bit of a kick on the end. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. And to cut us a check, it is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Cool Ranch. Cool Ranch for all your podcasting needs. <laughs> smart food, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Scale of 1 to 10, Matthew. Um, well, I feel smarter. Right, right, so, right. <laughs> and it, it, I, I, I love Cool Ranch. Uh, I'd say 7 or 8. 7 or 8. All right, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'll give it, I'll give it a 7. All right. That's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Smart food. <laughs> good job with the Doritos, uh, Doritos uh, combination. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good. You know, a spicy nacho. Oh. I mean, I love Doritos spicy nacho. Yeah. You give me a spicy nacho popcorn smart food, I, 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 might, I might give you an 11. <laughs> I might give you an 11. Uh, but yeah, smart food, Doritos brand, popcorn, Cool Ranch. Uh, good job, you guys. Yeah. All right. Thank you, smart food. Thank you, Smart Food. Uh, <laughs> so, Matthew, why don't you yeah. tell us a little bit about um, where you're from and, and how you got into film? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm uh, born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, West Hollywood area. Went to John Burroughs Junior High School and Fairfax High School and oh. uh, how I got into film. You, you know, I, I never intended to get into film. Um, really? I, I grew up in and around... The entertainment business. I was actually a professional musician for uh-huh. 15 years. I went to uh, USC School of Music. I was a jazz guitar major, and then I was playing in rock bands and awesome, awesome. doing that. And then had a kid, and the lifestyle changed a little bit, <laughs> and uh, as, or a as lot it of does. it, as yeah. it does when you have a kid. Yeah, and then uh, I I fell into acting. You know, I had uh, friends who were agents who were like, hey, you should, like, music videos were really big back then. This was like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Okay, okay. So they were like, oh, you know, you could, you know, play guitar in this. So I was in, like, Ronan Keating. Uh, He was an artist from England. Okay. I was in one of his videos. I was in Anastasia. I was in Alanis Morissette. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so I was like guitar in this one, bass in this one, keyboard in this one. Awesome, awesome. And then I started doing commercials. Um, You know, I was like working in casting, but then I would working, you know, I was doing commercials. I had like, I guess, good comedic timing or whatever. (laughs) Um, So I was acting, and then people were always like, do you write? Right. And I was like, nah, I don't have anything to say. I got nothing to right, you know? right, and, then, right. and then one day I came up with this idea for a short film and I wrote it because uh, I wanted to act in it. Okay, okay. And then that was my first short. It was called Kung Fu Man. And basically, uh, my wife at the time was pregnant with our twins. Oh, no. Yeah. And I, you know, I was watching like reruns of the Kung Fu series. Okay, okay. Which I loved growing up. Right, and right. I was watching it and I was, you know, training in martial arts and stuff a lot at that time. And so I was like, yeah, this guy's all Zen. 
now, but what if he was like in the real world right. with a pregnant wife and you know, you know, uh, having to like get a job and right, all of that? Right. And so Kung Fu Man kind of melded those, mm. uh, you know. And so I I started writing shorts and acting in shorts, and then I started directing. Oh. And I had worked in casting, so I was directing actors all the time. Okay, okay. Um, and so my, you know, my joke was, yeah, if, if you know, music and acting don't work out, I'll just fall back onto directing. Right, 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 <laughs> and right. Then, and then right. I fell back onto directing. And so um, I started doing shorts, and and then I I wrote a short film called Anna, which was a horror film. Okay. That all took place on Skype, and at oh, the time right, right. that hadn't been done yet. And then a producer saw that. I was like, you should turn this into a feature. And right, like, right. Like, how am I going to turn this into a feature? But I, but I just started working it, you know, right, expanding right. the script. And it became this feature film called Chatter, which did the festivals, won awards, yeah, we got yeah. distribution. But it was like, I started it, and because it was all out of pocket, right, right. You know, it just took a, so long, it took time. a long time. And right. So then there was that movie Unfriended that came out. I was just about to ask you that because yeah. I, I saw something like that before. Yeah, like, and so there. you know, like one day, like we're you know we're finishing up my film, and a friend of mine sends me an email. He's like, "Bro, they made your movie." <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, crap. What do you mean? And so I look. <laughs> that's pro- that's probably has to be like the worst like email you could yeah. receive. Like, bro, they've made. <laughs> Yeah, and people had said things like that before, but it wasn't really that. Right. But unfriended, it yeah, was like, yeah. oh shit, they, that's it. Right. You know, right. and it's different. Like my, you know, chatter is more paranormal activity. Okay. You know, where it centers okay. around a couple, and there's like a ghost. You right. Know, that right. Kind of travels back and forth through the internet. But unfriended was more like I know what you did last summer with the ensemble cast. Right. And, right. Right. Sort of right. Thing. Because they were like all on like a group chat or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Sorry so you know, that happened. I mean, it still got distributed. We got a lot of good reviews. Um it was actually, you know, that's before we were all on Zoom all the time. Right, right. You right, know, so right. it was still like and and I had like I remember I did a, a one of the scenes, this guy's driving and he's FaceTiming, and people were like, Nobody does that. And like <laughs> <laughs> and here we are, like everybody does that. Everybody. And, you know, makes TikToks that way. Right, or, right, or, you know, whatever. Right. So I was like ahead of my time, but, you know, Unfriended kind of beat me out. You know, it's yeah. funny because I was driving yesterday. My wife, like, FaceTimed me like two times. And, like, mm. she knew I was driving. I'm like, why are you FaceTiming? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I can't see you. I'm like, yeah. What you, my phone is kind of staring to the at car. the roof. Here. Like, what oh, are you yeah. doing? <laughs> right that's crazy okay yeah. so, so so that happened and then you know i start. i was writing more scripts and developing other projects and okay. trying to raise funding for uh other horror films and okay. then and then i had you know some dramas and comedies like my background was in comedy okay um but along the way i was doing conflict resolution work because mm. I, I was always uh interested and fascinated with communication and relationships and uh, bringing people together right. and, you know, social justice, which, you know, is from my upbringing in LA going to like, you know, my friends were everybody. Right, and right. So at a young age, as a white male, I saw how my black friends in particular were treated differently right. and just had different experiences. So I was doing conflict resolution hmm. and traveling and, you know, working with universities and corporations. And then the pandemic started Wow. Okay. and I couldn't go anywhere. And so I'm sitting around, I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't go anywhere. Right. And I was like, I'll go back to school. And mm. so I finished my bachelor's, and then I went into a master's program in public administration uh-huh. um, because I was like, I think I'm done with film. And I So you had decided, like, no more film? Yeah, I was like, you know, nothing's happening. I'm doing this. I'm really inspired by conflict resolution. This was, you know... Uh, Post George Floyd, so I was okay. like, I, and I was writing a lot. I wrote uh, a weekly column for the Good Men Project. Oh wow! And I was okay. writing about relationships, but also sexism and racism and that sort of thing. Yeah. So you know, I was like, look, what you know, I've been living my whole life doing all this creative stuff, right. which was great. Uh, but you know, I have kids. I care about my friends. I care about the, the community. Right, so right. I was like, I need to do something. I'm all, I just turned 50, you know, right. so I'm like, I got to leave my mark. I got to do something. So you I figured. I had a midlife crisis. Yeah, a bit. yeah. I was like, all right. So I, you know, I went into public administration 
not sure what would be on the other side, but I figured it'd be government or politics or policy making or, uh-huh. or working for a nonprofit or right, something. Right, right, something like that. Um, but then, you know, I'm doing my coursework and everything I'm writing about is about policing and incarceration mm. and all the things that don't work mm. and looking for what are the alternatives. Right. And so when it came time to do my final thesis, uh, one of my academic advisors was like, you know, we know you can write a paper, but we also know you're a filmmaker. Why don't you make like a documentary or something? And, you know, I was like, uh, that's a lot of work. Right, right, and she's like, right. yeah, it could be like five or 10 minutes. I'm like, I can't do right, this right, in five right, or 10 right. minutes. And I am a filmmaker, so it's not going to be like a little video. It's going to be a movie. Right, right. And and she was like, well, we'll then do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, why not? Um, and did, so did, did they give you funding for it? No, or I asked. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, we're trying to keep our school running. We don't have fun. Um, but you know, I've always been super resourceful. Like I, yeah. you know, even as a musician, like I started engineering and recording. And so I, I you know, I knew like pro tools and yeah, audio yeah. and, you know, I, when I was doing short films, like I was editing on iMovie and then, fi- you know, Final Cut was right, like, oh, right. I got Final Cut 7, right, you know, right, back in the right, day. Right, right, So I was like, well, I know I can do a significant amount on my own. Yeah. You know, I, I upgraded my iPhone so that I could shoot on 4K. <laughs> so I got an iPhone 13, rented a second iPhone, and I just started interviewing people. And Wait, you shot it on your iPhone? I sh- yeah, I shot yeah, my, my iPhone right here. I shot it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I used uh, Filmic Pro, the app, okay. um, to get depth of field. And, and Okay, okay, and, okay. You know, and I rented a second one, so I had an A camera and a B camera. Nice. And a friend of mine loaned me uh, a Sennheiser, Lavalier, and a Zoom. Oh, so okay. recorded the sound. I had two little, like, uh, Neewer lights. Okay, yeah, like, yeah. Two little lights. And that was my rig. And I just showed up with, like, two, you know bag and set it up and i was like let's do it and and like everybody in the film jumping ahead like when they saw the final product they're mm-hmm. like this was a your school project you know because they uh, saw how i showed up right right you know and so they, and they, they thought were it was like, gonna be like rinky dink yeah, yeah, yeah. they're like wow this is like a real a movie you wow. know so so you know that brought me back into film yeah and now you know we did a test screening um I hired uh, somebody who could do graphics and tighten up the edit, yeah. and then, uh, somebody else who I had worked with before, who is an audio mixer and composer. Like he, you know, did the audio mix and awesome. all of that. Awesome. Um, so out of pocket, you know, was that, but but basically, I, you know, one man band, you know, man. edited on my MacBook with uh, Premiere Pro. Okay. You know, okay. and so and then and then we've been, you know. Playing festivals, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Beyond Hollywood was amazing. Thank you. And it was great to see it, like in a movie theater, right, you know, right. on a yeah, screen. Um, and then you know, winning awards. But then we've also been doing community impact screenings, which my my dream was to have this film be, uh, you know, a tool for right, right. for abolition, restorative justice, for transforming public safety, right. and for people to be able to say. Oh, you want to know what defund the police means, or oh, you want to know what abolition means, right. or you want to know why there are problems with policing? Go right, right. we'll see this film, and then we'll talk. Which is what, like in my class, um, through my process, I was like, I know this stuff doesn't work, but who do I call if there's a problem? Right. And right. and one of my fellow students who uh, is black and from Milwaukee was mm. like, Hey, you should go read some Mary Am Kaba. We do this till we free us, and then come and talk to me, and and so that started me like on on, on this like journey. the abolition yeah. journey of what are the alternatives, right, and, and right. who do we call, you know, if there are problems, right, right, you know, and so that's that's what's been happening. So since February, it's now July. Uh, almost a thousand people have seen the film. Awesome at impact screenings. We do panels, you know, with local uh, activists yeah. and politicians and. Uh, we've had former cops, you know, on the panels. Have you, have you had a uh, present cop? <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, no, not yet. <laughs> oh man, I mean, because I, I was going to ask you, like, what, what, what do police officers think of, you know, like the alternatives and the things that you present in the mm-hmm. film? Um, it's but- int- it's interesting. Um, I haven't. I mean, I know. 
I know some cops who haven't seen the film. Okay. Um, uh, I actually just had a conversation with with somebody from LAPD who did see the film. Okay. And he was like, well, there's a lot that I agree with, and then there's some things that I don't agree with. And I think the thing... So in, in the film, I interviewed... Uh, George Gascon, who's okay. the L.A. County District Attorney. Okay. He was a cop for 40 years. He was LAPD. He was the chief of police in San Francisco. Oh, wow. And chief of police in Mesa, Arizona. Oh, wow. And he's a, um, a what they call a progressive prosecutor. Okay. Where his goal is rehabilitation, right. is lowering sentences, not charging, you know, a bunch of crimes that are, you know, right, right. poverty related or right, you know, right. whatever that aren't Vic- like victimless crimes. Yeah, victimless much. crimes. Yeah. You know, and so like even before he took office, he was getting all kinds of flack and people wanting to recall him before he even took office. And actually, crime has come down. There was just a report. Like there was a nationwide spike yeah. that everybody was blaming him for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and now crimes come down and nobody's nobody's saying anything. Right, you know? right. But so he, you know, he was a cop for forty years, and then Hadia Kennedy, who's in the film, was LAPD for eleven years, and you know, both of them are like, yeah, we need to make changes. We need to reduce police contact. We need to um, have communities have resources and right. that sort of thing. Um, but I'm, but with. You know, the, the cops that I've talked to and, you know, even the two the former ones that are in the film, yeah. it's really hard to get to, yeah, we need to just get rid of police, mm. you know, which is understandable because they see life through a very specific lens yeah. that's programmed in and programmed in and yeah, programmed yeah. in that most of us don't, you know, don't see. Right, you know? right, right. So, it, you know, it makes sense. But that was also something that I think is important with the film because... You know, it shows different. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think a lot of people talk about like getting rid of police. Period. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the the goal, and this, and like abolitionists like recognize, and even in the film, they're like, this this is not going to happen in our lifetime. Right. But the goal is to get away from punishment and the punitive, like revenge, retaliation. Um, yeah, throw people in a cage and forget right. about them. Exactly. You know. Exactly. And, and to really move towards, uh, you know, communities of care. Right. Right. People are taken care of. They have resources. When people are resourced, when communities are resourced, crime goes down, and that's right. been shown. Right. 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 You know, yeah, when when they're when prisons like in other countries are geared towards rehabilitation, recidivism, crime goes down. Yeah. You know, yeah. people returning goes down. Right. Exactly. You know, so if we can, sh- it's a long-term game that a lot of stuff has to happen. Like even like personally, like yeah, we have yeah. to get out of our minds that, Oh, I just, we need to get re- revenge. Right. Right. You know, right. Punishment, uh, punishment, punishment, punishment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, when, when you, when you think about like a lot of times when people have, when people go back into the, the prison system, it's just because they just don't have an opportunity mm-hmm. or, you know, they don't get a shot. And, yeah. you know, it's like people look at you a certain way like, oh, well, you made your mistake. Like, that's it for you. You yeah. know what I mean? And I think that's one of the big things that we have to get away from um, because, I mean, you know, people deserve a, another opportunity, especially if they, you know, do their time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like they still being in prison yeah. even after they come out. So, yeah, once I mean, you're, once somebody's convicted of something, like that's on your record, you automatically, it's harder for you to get housing, loans, jobs. Yeah, everything. Everything. There, there was a, we had a screening in Kansas City uh, a few weeks ago. Okay. And there was a gentleman on the panel, Johnny Waller, who's, you know, very active in the community and works with, um, formerly incarcerated people. Okay. He also runs like three businesses and, and uh, does something to run the, the law school at uh, University of Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. So. Um, and we were talking to him and he was like, he's been, you know, out of prison for 20 something years. Yeah. And he's like, they still refer to me as convict when I'm being interviewed. So they'll be like, yeah, and coming up next, we have, you know, this person and convict you know, and then his name. I don't want to say his name. Right, you know, right. But they, and I'm like, not even former? He's like, no. So, like, it stays, it stays with It's like people. a scarlet letter. <laughs> yeah. And, like, he's doing amazing work. And yeah. he's highly respected. And, you know, his story, 
is, you know, he grew up, you know, single mom. Mm. They were, you know, there was, he was trying to take care of his family, right, you know, right. got into gangs and drugs because yeah. there weren't other options, you know, or not, he didn't have access to other options. Yeah. You know, and he's like, if somebody would have just come in and been like, here's how you start a business and here's yeah. how you make money and here's how you, like, he's like, I would have done that in a second. Right. You know, so. I mean, because. I mean, what what you're talking about, it's like, I mean, you, you would have to change, like, like, it doesn't even, it's not just affecting, like, the criminal justice system. It's like the education system. Yeah. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's like the community period. It's like everything would, would need to change mm-hmm. in order for you to get to where, you know, where I think, you know, you, you, would, you would think, like, is an ideal place for a community. I mean, yeah. you know, back in the days, they they used to have like, you know, you could be a mechanic or a plumber mm-hmm. coming out of high school. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They yeah. they taught you like certain things. They taught you trades like in high school, mm-hmm. and I mean, you don't even get that. So yeah. you come out and you take debt going to college, and you know, get degrees, mm-hmm. and sometimes it doesn't really lead to anything tangible for you. Yeah, like you know, we need to give people more skills. You know, skills pay the mm-hmm. bills and you know, a lot of people don't have the skills to to really be, you know, a member of society. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. to find to find their place there. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You need to change a lot, man. I mean, have have you showed anybody like an education system like the film? Yeah. And, I mean, there's there've been uh, educators, teachers who have come to screenings. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And they're you know. All, all about it. Because even in the film, they talk about how, you know, like the defund the police slogan. Right, right. You know, has been so polarizing. Right. But lar- largely because, like, that discussion got shot down real quick. You know, yeah. and there was that big backlash and and everything. So, but, but in the film, a couple people talk about how, uh, you know, people don't want to defund the police, but we've defunded education. Right. You know, we've defunded, like, there's less public housing than there right, was right. You know, 10, 20 years ago. Right. You know, there's less resources. Cost of living. I mean, I'm born and raised in LA. Yeah. Um, I, I can barely, you know, not even afford to live right, right. in LA if I wasn't, <laughs> you know, born and raised here. You, you know, right. no, um, really. you know, everybody's holding on to the, like rent controlled mm-hmm. apartments and stuff. Um, but, but then, you know, we, oh man, the, the uh, unhoused numbers just came out. And so when I started, when I was in my master's program, uh, like within the last two years, you know, the unhoused numbers were like 66,000 in LA County, mm. and now it's like 75,000. Oh, you know, wow. it, it went up 9%. Um, and, you know, Karen Bass, the mayor, like she came in, she was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, get 10,000, 10, you know, homes or right, whatever. Right, right. And like, that doesn't even make a dent. You know, Crazy. and and then you know Rick Caruso ran for mayor. We had like two years of his commercials. Right, right. Uh, I'm so glad those are done. But you know, he spent 100 million dollars on a campaign, and like, why don't you like you build malls? Why don't you build some homes, right. apartments, right? Something, something. You know, man, he spent 100 million on this campaign. Yeah, yeah, it was ridiculous. And then Karen Bass, I I, I forget. I think it, maybe it was like. I don't know. I'm throwing a number out there. I could be wrong, like forty million or something. Forty million or, or might have been less. No, you know what? It was less than that. I forget. Don't quote me. So to <laughs> run for mayor? Yeah, yeah. It was lo- it was less. And then Gina Viola, who's in the film, yeah, like I think she had like like fifty grand in or something, and she came in third, and she ran on an abolitionist platform. Wow. You know, and but it's it's like, you know, I mean, it's mar- it's marketing. You yeah, know, it's- and you have to do it, but also. You know, like there's there's other avenues, which is what Gina did, which is great. Mm-hmm. You know, using TikTok and Instagram and word of mouth and getting out and like pounding the pavement, right, 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 building coalitions. Like it was amazing, um, all the support she had from from the various groups. You know, in in did, LA, did she did she run Democrat or did she run yeah. Independent? Democrat, Democrat. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, yeah, interesting, man. Yeah, interesting. yeah, because she was in the primary. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm. I mean, we gotta get out of this two party system mm-hmm. too. That's uh, 
I think that hurts people a lot, man, because it's just like these guys have so much money behind them. It's just, you know, it's hard to be seen. You know, you're trying to fight through the crowd. It's like trying to put out your album. You yeah. trying to fight through all yeah. the, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like all the music that's being put out every day. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult, man. Like it's a, it's a oh, I can't remember the lady's name, but she's running for, um, she's running for president. But she does like a lot of TikTok, a lot of mm. um, white lady. I can't remember her name. But she she speaks, you know, mm-hmm. um, reparations and, you know, oh, oh, this Mar- country. Oh, Marianne Williamson? Marianne Williamson, yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, you know, she'll be here for a couple months, but I, I doubt if she has the money to, to, to withstand, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And it's yeah. just, like, so unfortunate, um, you know, that it takes, like, millions of dollars to be in a running, you know what yeah. I'm saying, to to be a supposed to be a public servant. You right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like and then and, then, make and sense. then that sets up like once you're in, how do you stay in? And then you gotta you're always fundraising and you know who's who's giving you money and right, what do right. you have to give up to get that money. Exactly. And all of exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's terrible, man. We got we gotta take the money out of politics. I mean Whew, it's yeah. terrible because I mean, even if you run on a good platform, it's like, like you said, once you get in there, you start taking money. It's like, all right, now your priorities have to change because you're mm-hmm. trying to stay in your position. You yeah. know what I mean? So, who do you have to uh, take advice from, mm-hmm. and <laughs> write bills for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. So, t- tell me a little bit about, um, a little bit more about your. Let's go back a little bit. Tell me a little bit more about your music career and. Oh, <laughs> you know how 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 that was for you. Yeah, you know I, mean? I mean it was it was fun at the time. <laughs> you know, I was in my twenties and you know playing all the clubs in Hollywood, the Viper Room and the Whiskey oh, and the Roxy oh. Troubadour, awesome. all of that. Um, I played you know guitar in a couple bands. I played bass in a band. Um, you know, did, there, did you ever get a record deal? Or? No, that was like the one thing. Like we had a huge following, especially the last band I was in was called Abbey Booth. Okay, and I played bass in that band, and uh, we were playing like 1996 to 2001 or two. Okay, okay. And like we had sold out shows all the time. We played the Viper Room every Sunday night. We played the Mint every Tuesday night. Oh, awesome! And it was yeah, it was great. Um, always had like there were. You know, labels were around. Yeah. Um, but they were like, it was it was at the time when all the the major labels were kind of collapsing. It was like right before Napster. It was before YouTube and all yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so uh, and it was after like all the Seattle bands. Oh, so, okay, okay. So okay. the music industry in LA kind of went to shit. You know, for a while, mm. um, and you know, because it was booming in the eighties, right, and early nineties, and then and then when the Seattle thing happened, um, which is a lot of my favorite rock music. I, yeah. I'm into a lot of different things, but like, you know, all the labels were looking elsewhere. You know, mm. and and so it was it was a hard time for the business. Yeah. So it was a hard time for us, and um, looking back, if we would have just gotten a van and toured like we probably would have been better off but right. we we're like ah, oh, we're in la this is where we need to be and so you know we did west coast stuff okay okay but never really got out you know you, oh you guys never went to like arizona no texas no we didn't we should have done that oh. we did. i played in bands that uh like the band before that um like we played in chicago and some other places okay okay um, but we yeah we 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 were more like focused on what we were doing here, right? You know, right. Should have just got on the road. Yeah, you got you got to get out. You yeah. got to because you got to build that following. And, mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Be able to go to these record labels like, hey man, we yeah. sold out here, 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 uh-huh. here, here. Yeah, yeah. Because we were showing that in LA, but and then also, you know, we were kind of a un- we were we were a very unique band because it, it was it was rock, but like we had a the drummer she played like. uh hand percussion mm. but with sticks so it was oh, like a okay. drum circle kind of sound dope, you know dope. with a kit and you know three piece um and, and like i said we had a big following but we'd also you know we were we had songs that were really great but we also would jam on them so they were like are you a jam band are you rock? like 
<laughs> like they didn't know how to label us. Right, right, right. You know, right. and and that was frustrating because like people were singing our songs, you know. Really. And and there were bands, you know, like Galactic and all of that fish. Oh god. You know, so it's like we could have jumped on those circuits too. Yeah, yeah. But it just it just didn't we just couldn't get to that level get over know? that hump yeah, 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 yeah. Which, you know it was like that's what i wanted from the time i was like six so you know as i was like oh man you know music was the 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 girlfriend that broke up with me that yeah. broke my heart that look yeah. trust me man I, I i know it firsthand man i know it firsthand i and, and i agree with you too like i feel like like man i should have just went out on the road and just mm-hmm. But, you know, starting a family young is yeah. like, you know, I'm not going to leave my family for three, four months. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm-hmm. trying to make it. So, no, nah, I, I feel your pain, man. I definitely feel your pain. Yeah. So, when did you guys decide to that it that it was done? Um, Jesus mm-hmm. Lord. Reimagining safety. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, it, it ran its course. Like, that, that last band, we were together six years, and then I wanted to write more, and I was doing, like, solo stuff and okay uh the drummer was writing more and she wanted to do solo stuff and okay and so we you know and it, it just got like it wasn't fun anymore yeah yeah it's you know ran its course yeah. yeah and then you know i did a couple other things and then got into like composing and so i was doing music for movie trailers and oh you know, okay. film and tv no you know nothing, nothing major because that because then i started to tra- you know go into acting okay. More. okay okay um but yeah that was it, it just Kind of got old and, oh, you know, man. all of that. Man, that hurts my it, heart, It's man. interesting, though, because, <laughs> like, I love uh, history, like, you know, behind the music yeah, stuff, yeah. or even film, too. Yeah. But, like, all of these bands that, that got big and, you know, they got into drugs and alcohol and, um, you know, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money. Right, right. You know, it's like, all right, well, at least I didn't <laughs> have that happen. <laughs> Um, I still would have liked to tour and, you know, right, like right. I loved being on stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was fun. Like just playing shows was fun. Um, you know what I hated? I hated uh, shooting music videos. Mm. I can not stand shooting music. Yeah. I probably shot about maybe I probably have about six music videos. Okay. I hated every single one of them. <laughs> I can not stand music videos. Did you, did you guys like make music videos um, as well? We, did we? We we yeah a couple of bands we did I always liked it it was fun for me I you know I I grew up performing like <laughs> I was a tap dancer and all of that <laughs> shit. Like, <laughs> you know and I was in you know like you know I wasn't a theater kid like in school but okay. you know, I did theater stuff and is was in groups that like went to like shopping malls and you know performed at malls. <laughs> Grew up in L.A., what do you want? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I liked being in front of... It was it, it was easier for me to be on stage in front of people than uh, to be, like, in groups talking or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Because I was, I was always, like, really shy. Right, so, no, I feel you. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I love performing. Performing mm. was great. Music videos, not so much. Yeah. I couldn't stand them. Couldn't stand them. Yeah. So, the, so that was the extent of your music career, and that, and that was... yeah. Pretty much. I was done. Yeah. Damn, man. Yeah. Okay. So, how how did you come up with um, with with chatter, like what? Yeah. You know what 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 brought about it? Because, like you said, it wasn't really like everybody wasn't on Zoom at the time yeah. and FaceTime or nothing like um, that. Yeah. So it was so the around 2010, 10 or eleven. I was on Twitter a lot, okay. and I was in a lot of. You know, I had a lot of friends who were filmmakers and actors, and like there was a group of friends in the UK. Okay. And we were always like, "Oh, I wish there was a way to work together." You know, but you're there and I'm here, and so like one day I was like, "Well, what if we use Skype for something?" Mm. And and you know, one of the uh, actresses that I that I knew, she was like, "That would be cool." And so I was I was thinking to do like a romantic comedy okay because you know? yeah, i was yeah. doing mostly comedy and you know that just it made sense to right do something like that way um but then uh i was i was skyping with a with another friend of mine and you know it's picture in picture right so yeah. you see both so his cat jumped up behind him 
But for some reason in my brain, it was like, oh shit, there's a cat behind me. <laughs> and, and it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, that's scary. Right, right, and right. And so, and I had seen paranormal activity. Like, I grew up on yeah, horror, and, yeah. you know, and I was like, hmm, let me let me think on that. And so I wrote this uh, a short film called Anna, okay. which, the you know, the wife was in the UK, the husband was in LA for a job, and, you know, she was supposed to move and, and all of that. And so they're using Skype to stay in contact. Yeah. But then over the course of the, the nine minutes short, we see that the place that he's in is haunted. And so mm. all of these things are happening and she can't help him. And, you know, he's deteriorating. And, and then the, the ghost, you know, starts like crossing over through the Internet. Oh, wow. And so that was Anna, the short film. And then a producer saw that and he was like, this is really good. You should, you know, expand it into wow. a feature. And so um, I added characters and... Uh, you know, made it more common for people to be <laughs> like right, Skyping with each right, other, right. you know, before Zoom. Um, and so there was that. And then, and then it was like, well, how are we seeing this? Hmm. And, you know, it was, oh, the NSA is monitoring video chat conversations in the name of Homeland Security. Because there was, at the time, there was this thing about like spying, you know, government right, spying. Right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's this technician who works for the NSA who's really, you know, kind of a creepy voyeur, you know, who is like, oh, here's this couple and, right, right. You know, and he's watching them and then he sees what's happening, but he can't help them either because the government's like, hey, that's, that's their right, business. Right, <laughs> you know, we can't right. get involved in that. So that, that became Chatter. And, wow. Yeah. And I got to work with um, Richard Hatch. From Battlestar Galactica. Oh, nice. Who, like, growing up, he was one of my childhood heroes. I loved Battlestar Galactica. That's awesome. You know, That's and so awesome. he was in the film. Amazing guy. He passed away uh, a couple years after we filmed. Yeah. But amazing guy, you know, yeah. and I got to work with him, which was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, did you take that through the film festival circuit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah won a bunch of awards. Um, you know, the horror festivals really loved it. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Dope, yeah. Dope. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was fun. Yeah. Did you uh were you able to land distribution with it yeah. at least? Yeah, ITN was the distribution company. Okay. And so awesome. You know, when they first released it, it was on like Dish and On Demand and Amazon. It's still on Amazon. You can still get it on Amazon. Right. Um, and a couple other like Fandango had a streaming. Oh, okay. service, right, right, right. You know, some other companies. So you know, it was cool. And then and then we you know we got some foreign distribution. So awesome. you know, awesome. you know, every now and then I'll get a statement that you know, you know, someone in Thailand, <laughs> somebody in Thailand watched it. <laughs> so it's like, all right, cool. Uh, how much? How much? How much of your royalty check? Uh, they're not much because the you know with distribution they you know they had a lot of uh, expenses. Fees, fees, yeah. fees. You know, gotta gotta make a poster for a gazillion dollars. <laughs> but you know, when we recoup, we'll send you your thing. Uh, I was just happy to get a distribution. How, how how is the the distribution game? Because I've heard like I've heard it's terrible. Like yeah, they uh, I heard like you get charged for just like mind numbingly like crazy stuff. Yeah, like, it's tough. I mean, there's like. there's a a ton of films. There's a ton of people trying to make money off films. Right. There's a ton of people that are full of shit. So it's like you know you don't really know like. Who were and and then there's there's distributors and there's sales agents and there's aggregators and like there's all these different things and it's like, well, who who do I actually need to get this to? Right, right. You know, who's legit? Right. You know, who's not going to screw me? <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's all set up to yeah. I mean, we're seeing like with the writers' strike, um, you know, like you know, companies like you know. Netflix and whomever are making yeah. like record profits, right? But the writers are you know getting paid less and less and less because you know it used to be you would you'd get like what twenty six episodes on a like a sitcom or yeah, something, yeah, you know, yeah. and you could like make a lot of money and then right. develop other projects. Yeah. But then you get on a you know a streaming show that's six episodes, right? right. That pays less anyway, and then you got to like jump from job to job to job, and so you know it. And and that's the writers, like actors, like it. It's really, um, it's become harder and harder to make a living. 
you it know, is. to sustain yourself. And yet all these companies are making a lot of money. Right. You know, right, right. You know, and, the, and, the, and, the, you know, they're trying to take away our, you know, you can't share your passwords anymore and stuff like that. And it's like, come on, man, it's like $15. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm still using my mom's password. Man, you know? real talk, but, you know, real yeah. talk. Yeah. No, that's. So it's tough. No, you, you I know. mean, it's, it's, it seems like it's. Like it, like everything is like the gig economy now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everything is all right. You're not employed here. You're ten ninety nine, and yeah, all right. It, we'll have you this time, but next week we can't have you. And yeah. you know we got somebody else. And mm-hmm. you know what I mean you keep getting like, you know, people love to create. You know, I mean it's in music, it's mm-hmm. in film now. You know what I mean? Like people love to be creative, and it, yeah. and it feels like you know, the creatives are really being taken advantage of, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? We kind of, like, we always have been because they know at the end of the day we just want to, like, do stuff. Right, right, right. But it's... uh, it's, He he just wants to make an album. All right, (laughs) we'll do that. We'll take all his publishing, but, you know, he can make that album, (laughs) you know? Yeah, I mean, all all of that, you know? And then, I mean, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the, like, sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff is also set up to keep the machine going right and, right you know, make people easier to be taken advantage of and yeah. y- you know it's 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 tough and and you know it, it, interesting though tying back to reimagining safety yeah. the abolitionists that i interviewed most of them are artists you know mm. they're slam poets and musicians mm. and painters and writers and you know all of this and i was asking actually nikki black who is in the film she's a sociologist from Inglewood, and mm-hmm. she's an award-winning slam poet. I was oh, like, wow. "What's up with with that?" And she's like, "Cause we think outside the box, yeah, you know, and we create, and we want to create things that affect people, and you know, right, right. And so, and, and it keeps us going, right, you know, right. because it is very bleak if you just look at things on the surface how they are. But if I can, you know, go write a song or a poem and perform it in front of people with all this other, sh- like I was. Man, uh, yesterday, um, I have a, a friend who's in recovery uh-huh. and uh, within the LGBTQ plus community. Uh-huh. And they had like this, they had a performance, you know. And so it was like the intersecting community of recovery, LGBTQ plus, and all these people performing. And there was a trans, you know, a woman of trans experience who was performing and just like tearing it up. Mm. And everybody loved it. And there was so much joy and emotion. Yeah. And for me, sitting there as a cis hetero white male, like recognizing they're doing all this in the face of all of this shit that's coming right, at right, right now, right, right, you know, right. and dealing with you know addiction and, and that sort of thing. And right. it was like I actually like I was moved to tears. Like I I I, re- I was like wow, I'm getting choked up, right? Because like, but I but in the context of this conversation, like here's the outlet that keeps us going. And brings us joy, yeah, and you know helps us connect with with one another. No, definitely, you know. Definitely. So, I, yeah. No, I hear that. It, it's it's just that, you know, when it when it's time to when it's time to monetize it, yeah, you know, yep. it, it's 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 difficult not to see like, you know, the reward for the creativity that you put out into the world, and mm-hmm. you know. Sometimes you have to give away ownership, you know, yeah. big percentages of the ownership of, you know, your creative IP, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, at at the end of the day, like, it's it's being taken advantage of, yeah. you know what I mean? It's being exploited um, instead of being, like, nurtured and cared mm-hmm. for and, you know, helping to bring about, you know, other artists that can, you know, that can add to the movement, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like it's it's very difficult to watch, man. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it's, it's very difficult. And you want to be supportive, but then there's the competition part because yeah. you know, like resources resources are limited. They yeah. they they don't have to be limited, right, right? Right. But by design, they're limited. Exactly. And so it just yeah, it's 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 hard. Like I love being part of, you know, filmmaker communities and yeah. activist communities and. Um, academic communities yeah. you know and like it it there's a lot of tug of war because right. when the monetization 
uh, comes into play and capitalism and, y- you know, the the need for somebody to get ahead on the backs of others, like right. all of that shit. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a lot to navigate. Right, right, you know? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, it really feels like you need to be a, a, a business person first and then mm-hmm. an artist second, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's not really how a lot of artists work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I've taken a bunch of business <laughs> seminars, and I'm like, I, I, I still don't care. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like I still don't know how to make an LLC. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the yeah. hell's going on. <laughs> Actually, I made one, and then I didn't do anything. And then, you know, it's like, <laughs> no, but it's, it's difficult, man. I mean, you gotta, yeah, you gotta, you gotta learn your business. You yeah, gotta I, learn your business. My, my daughter's 18. And, and I, I um, uh, took her to open up a bank account. Okay. And the banker is going through, like, all the stuff. Like, you need this minimum balance and this thing, and then this account is this thing, and, like, all of, And I'm like... For a student account? Uh, Well, it's a adult. Like, she's 18. Oh, okay, okay. But still, okay. You, you know, it's but she like... She would still qualify for a student account, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the thing is, it's like, if you weren't... Uh, under 25 years old so if you're 25 and older yeah. you need this minimum balance or, right, this, right, right, or, this right. or this thing but you know it's free because you're under 25 oh, okay, okay but still okay. they're going through all the stuff you know and and i'm like that's a lot <laughs> like it's a lot for me and i'm you know i grew up with you know you got to read contracts and you got to yeah, pay attention yeah. and all of that but i you know i'm like gen z you know i i talked to my daughter afterwards and she's like that was like I'm, I don't even know what she was talking about at a certain point, you know, because it's like yeah. just give me the account to put my money in right, right, and, right. and the debit card so I can take right, it out, so. you know, so I can pay for shit, right? <laughs> you know, but all of it, like it's all, you know, like legal ease, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Le- you know, legal speak, like all of that stuff, it, it, you know, it's like you can't r- even like applying for jobs, you know, job descriptions. It's so complicated it's like just just tell me right. you know like what do you need me to do okay yes i can i can do that no i don't know excel right, I, I, right. I can, but you know i can <laughs> but i can do other stuff i can type though I yeah can i can type 30 <laughs> words per minute <laughs> i can text faster but yeah uh, so let, let me ask you this yeah. as as a a white man mm-hmm. because i know like you know, when when I, when I watch the film, it, it deals a lot with policing and things like that. Yeah. Um, I know you said you had like friends, you know, growing up that had different experiences mm-hmm. from you, but why is this like so? Why is this topic like so important for you? Um, for you to, I, I know you had to do it like for your, for for your school and mm-hmm. everything, but it seems like it's still like an important topic for you just in general. Yeah. Um, why is it so important to you? I mean, uh. I mean, have you been beaten up by the police before? Uh, I no, I haven't been beaten up by the police, <laughs> but but my my friends have. Oh, you know, and you know, so look, I I grew up going to school with, you know, we had slavery, we abolished slavery. There right. was segregation. There was the civil rights movement, right. MLK, peaceful protest, and now we're good. Right, you know. <laughs> And then to all see that, soft. yeah, and then to see, <laughs> no, we're not all good, and yeah. my friends aren't all good, right. and, you know, you know, so I th- I think, you know, like, recognizing that what I was being taught and, you know, socialized to believe, because yeah. it's in, like, our media, it's in film and TV and, and oh, yeah. all of that, uh, was not right. And so, like, like there's a part of me. Somebody said it's in my astrological chart. I have some aspect that it's like all about justice and bringing bringing things to light. So, like, yeah, there's part of me that's like, no, that's not true. Right, <laughs> like, look, right. look, look, look what's happening. Right. You know, another element is I'm also Jewish, and uh, my parents were school teachers, hmm. and so you know, we were always like, you know, middle class. Um, you know, and when I went to Hebrew school to learn about my culture and yeah. religion and all of that, uh, the temple we went to was in Beverly Hills. Okay. And so that's a very rich community, wealthy community. Yeah. And so I was an outcast there and I got made fun of, you know, we call it bullying now. I got made fun of, you know, there. And so I, I, you know, what was that? Fourth grade? No, second grade. Um, 
And they bullied you just because you were new. I was or an outcast. Just wasn't I was like a part of the wasn't rich part, crew. Wasn't part yeah. of the rich crew. I I liked learning, mm. and none of them wanted to be there. So there was like that part. So like I didn't fit in, and not only did I not fit in, but I was like like got getting my not physically, but getting my ass beat like every week wow. because they would just talk shit, and nobody did anything about it. Wow. You know, so so I I I knew what that felt like for me. Yeah. And I didn't want anybody else to experience that. So yeah. then when my friends would tell me, yeah, this happened with the police or this happens when I go into a store, like yeah, we would yeah. go to, you know, we used to hang out at the Beverly Center. Okay, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And so we'd go there and they get followed around stores or like people would be looking at them or like when we got older and we were driving, like my 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 friends were always like, yeah, you need to drive. You know, because I was less likely to get pulled over, over, you know? So, like, all of that was going on. And then when I was at USC, uh, early 90s, the Rodney King beating happened. Right, right. And those officers got acquitted. And it was like, how did they get acquitted? It's like right right there on video, you know? And then the LA riots. And then, um, you know, there was also a little bit after the riots where... Like, you know, it's like my, you know, my black friends, like they were like, you know, we're cool. We just need some space, mm. you know? And so a little bit of that happened, Interesting. And, but I understood right. and it was like, oh yeah, I, you know, and then the OJ Simpson and, um, and, and when I was going to USC and in, I was in music school, but I had to take the general eds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was taking sociology classes okay. and I really loved sociology and learning about like how, uh, you know, communities were created and societies and yeah. what, and we were learning about systemic racism. Mm. And one of my professors made this st- statement basically was like, the rules and laws in a society are created by the people in power right. to keep them in power. They're not going to create a law that like takes them out of power. Right. And so with all of that and recognizing, uh, you know, cause it was also like, there was, the, the crack epi- epidemic, so crack yeah. versus powder cocaine, right, right, right. sentencing and policing, um, you know, like somebody would also go to jail for like, you know, stealing food, but then there was a savings and loan scandal where the guy who did that embezzled like all this money, he went to like, you know, the country club prison. So like all of this stuff, I was like, holy shit, like this, this is, there are, t- there's two, two different yeah, justice yeah, yeah. systems. Yeah. You know, and so that stuck with me. And so it was really like, oh, if people just, un- I naively thought if people just understood what my professor <laughs> told me. <laughs> oh, they have that, to do is just learn what I've learned. Yeah, because I, like, be I was like, of course we all think Nazis are bad. Of course we all want everybody to be equal. Right, you know, right. of course we, you know, because I didn't understand the the economic incentives yeah, and the uh, the you know, the white supremacy. Right. I didn't know that. Like for me, it was, Oh, Geraldo's got like the Nazis on this week. And it was like, this is like group of like weird people. Right. Right. So all of that. And so the more that I saw how interwoven that was and, and everything. And then, and then when, um, uh, oh man, what's his name? Um, uh, Trayvon Martin was, Oh yeah, yeah. You know? And then it was like, Oh, George Zimmerman, of course he's going to get, you know, because we're past, you know, Rodney King was, you know. I was the last one. (laughs) Yeah, 20 years ago or whatever. You know, and then he got off. It's like, wow, we're doing the same shit. And then then Black Lives Matter and protests is like, this is a civil rights movement. But like so many people were pushing back against Black Lives Matter. Yeah. You know, and then All Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter and all of that. And, and, And negating, you know, when, you know, they would you know, white people in particular would negate the experiences of black people. Yeah, it's like, but that's yeah. their lived experience. Like, right. this is what's happening. Right. You know, and actually one of my friends that I grew up with, Dwayne, he, you know, I would like tag him into Facebook posts. I'm like, just tell them what, you know, what, what your experience is. And at one point he's like, bro, they don't care. Don't care. He's like, yeah. you have a better shot at getting through to them. So, you know, take the ball and run with it. He's like, but they're, they're not going to listen to me. Right. You know, right. and so I kind of, was doing that through social media and then writing and yeah. stuff. But but that's kind of where all of this comes from, you know. So so how 
are are we naive to think that there could there can be real change if the people like don't care? You know what I mean? Because you know at 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 a certain point, I mean, you could talk to you know you blew in the face, but yeah. if people don't care. It's like how does anything really change? You know what I mean? Giving people like the information that you give them in the documentary. I mean, like. For somebody like me, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, let's try to implement that. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you would think you would, that other people would want the same thing as well, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. So are we naive to think that it can even be possible to have that type of change? Uh, are we naive? I think, I, for me, I think I was naive to how much work there is to do. Hmm. Uh, I do, I do, like I have a, uh, my friend Chelsea Byers is on the West Hollywood City Council. Okay. And we were talking about this, you know, when I was doing the documentary and yeah. she was like, do you, do you still have hope? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to think about it, right, you know, right. and I was like, well, I wouldn't still be doing it if yeah, I didn't yeah. think there was, well, I probably would still be doing it because like, I can't not do it. Yeah, you know, I recognize that it has to change, and I have, you know, certain tools, you know, storytelling, filmmaking, whatever, yeah. and, um, but I think that, you know, what I've seen with my film is like there, there's some, you know, white folks who've come to screenings who were like, oh, I was afraid of defund the police, and I didn't know what it was about or how to explain it, but I understand it now and yeah. it makes a lot of sense. And so I'm going to start telling people this, you yeah. know, and there've been people who, who were like, yeah, I saw your film. And then, you know, you know, my mom's like a hardcore Republican Trump supporter, but I was explaining about resources and they were like, Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> you know? So, so I think, I think it's possible, you know, again, with this being, unfortunately abolition being like a long-term yeah. thing but also showing that there are alternatives that work right because we right. don't see that like right. we still have you know all these cop shows you know that show us this is the only way right right, right. You know? busting the door yeah bombs yeah. on yeah. the front door all of that <laughs> um so i think the more that we can plug into you know cahoots program in eugene oregon the star yeah, program yeah, in Denver, yeah, colorado yeah um you, you know there was just a thing with LAPD where there there's like 24 or 28 different tasks that LAPD won't be involved in now and other like you know mental health professionals or whatever will be involved. Oh wow. Okay. So showing that that works yeah um I think will help further things along. Yeah. Mm. The problem is which is what we're seeing I mean you know we're 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 taping this like after 2 days of the Supreme Court just blowing all every you know civil rights sh- to hell. Look, I I just saw um, after the ruling had came down, it was like four different networks had fired like um, black women that were in um, mm-hmm. roles for um, like uh, diversity for the network to make sure that they bring in like different wow. people to share more stories. Uh, four women, four black women were in charge of like different networks, and they all were let go within like twenty four hours yeah. of that ruling. Yeah. Like, that's that's insane. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, I think because you know white people are becoming the minority in this country. Hmm. Um. Uh. So you know, I forget. I was talking to somebody. It's like you know. You mess with people's money or their sense of security. Yeah. You know, because at the you know at the end of the day, we're all wired for survival. Right. You right. Know? So if we think we're under attack, um, you know, we're gonna dig in and fight back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but there's you know in the individualism, which is how America is. Uh, Americans are socialized, like well, right, it, right. it's all up to me, and it's I can do right, it. Right, right. Straps and all that. Yeah. But then there's like the collectivism, which is, you know, goes back to indigenous cultures and 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 you know tribal cultures and yeah. all of that, which is you know we're in it for each other. Right. Right. You know? And so the real security and safety is in the collective, 
but we we have to unpack and undo like years thousands, of, thousands yeah. of years of you know this other perspective so it's i think you know nikki black says it in the film she's like we got to go community by community person to person you know and and get it done that way and so Jeez. i think you know what's inspiring to me is you know, like I said, uh, almost a thousand people have seen the film. Yeah. And it's not about the film. It's about when we have 180 people show up in Memphis, mm. not only to watch the film, but for the panel discussion. Right, right. Local activists. Speak about it afterwards. You know, yeah. and policymakers. Like in Kansas City, um, you know, there were policymakers. There was a, uh, a woman running for city council mm -hmm. who was there. When we were in San Pedro, the... The local city council uh, member Tim McOsker, he was there. He's one of the people that, you know, co-sponsored the bill to reduce LAPD contacts. Oh wow! Okay. Um, you know, so I think I and then you know, there's movements like Gen Z for Change, where yeah. they're you know, because that they're most affected by what going to be most affected by what's happening. So, you know, I think I there's there's the battle, you yeah, know, between yeah. the w one side and the other, and I. I don't like to use good and evil anymore, cause right, it's, right. you know, but but there's there's the battle, yeah. And yeah. I think the you know especially you know a couple things after George Floyd, you know there there was a lot more people outside the black community that were like, no, this is wrong, and we need to like get involved, and yeah. you know. So I had I, you know I I saw the L.A. riots, you know, which were mostly around like South Central, and then some stuff came up into Hollywood back back in the day. Right. And then to have the protests post George Floyd be all around West Hollywood and Beverly Hills and uh, Long Beach and like, uh, you know, and organized protests. I was like, oh, okay. Like this is, this is bigger. Now people got scared and backed off or got, you know, lazy and backed off. But a lot of people have hung in a lot of, when I say a lot of white folks have hung in mm. and have started getting involved in anti-racism work. Like, as students, which, right, you know, I right. think, you know, as a white person, it's really important that to know how, where we show up and whose voice needs to be centered. And it's right. not ours. Like, you know, I show up as a student, you know, I made this film, but it's really a bridge to let, you know, the folks who, right, you know, know about stuff. this, right, they, right. let them yeah, talk about yeah. it, you know, um, so it, I it, it would have been a completely different film if it was just you sitting in the chair, yeah, talking to the camera. Here's what I yeah. think. <laughs> Let me tell you about racism. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, <laughs> man. So, so tell me um, a little bit more about the places that you've been to show the film, and um, where you planning to go as well. Yeah. So, um, well, San Pedro. Uh, was the first screening. We did a screening with Critical Resistance in L.A. Mm. Um, uh, and then uh, we've been to San Jose, California. Awesome. We had about 90 people there. And they want to do more, like, Bay Area screenings. So Oakland, um, Santa... Uh, well, I think that's Santa Clarita. It's, or, I don't know. You need to go to Oakland. Vallejo. Yeah. Please go to Vallejo. Try to get some police officers from Vallejo. Yeah. Too, that shit is... <laughs> mm -hmm. Ain't crazy up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so San Jose, we've done, you know, several screenings in L.A. We're actually going to be at the uh, uh, Skid Row Museum in August. August the Skid 18th. Row Museum? Skid, Skid Row Museum and Archive in downtown L.A. They have a museum and they do screenings and it's awesome. So, yeah, we're doing that in August. Wait, wait, wait. There's a Skid Row Museum yeah. dedicated to what? The history of Skid Row and... Um, uh, you know, there's different uh, activist groups that are involved there. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. supporting, you know, people who are on Skid Row. There's... Uh, I still don't know how I feel about that. I mean, to... I mean, I guess, I guess you're showcasing the people that have, you know, that donate their time there and, you know, to, to help the people that are down there. But, yeah. you know, I, I'm of the belief that, you know, there's no reason that we should have a... Skid Row, yeah, in Los Angeles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I mean, it, it, you know, how to, I mean, it. If I'm understanding correctly, like it, it became a dumping ground. Yeah, you know? and so like people would get out of the hospital and they didn't have a place to go. I was like, all right, well, here you go. Mm -hmm. You know, or out of a you know a, a drug rehab or something. Right. You right. Know? I remember 
you know, as an actor filming things downtown, like commercials or mm-hmm. whatever. And, you know, the, the, you know, the eighties would, would do their like uh, safety meetings and stuff. Yeah. Like, do not put anything down. Do not, you know, watch where you step, watch where you sit, watch, you know, you know and then you leave as the sun comes down. It's like, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a different experience. And, uh, you know, it all comes back to resources. It doesn't have to be like, that. right. Right. You know, Gina Viola, you know, coming back to her, like she was like, yeah, the, the unhoused problem is a policy like it's policy. Yeah. You know, it's not the policy's not designed to get people off the streets and resourced. We right. could do that if right. we wanted to. Like right. um L Jones, Dr. L Jones who's in Halifax, Nova Scotia, she's in the film and she talks about how you know, it's like you know, with 300 and something dollars a day in in Halifax to keep somebody locked up. It's 125 a day. <laughs> To put somebody in housing with resources and, you know. So it's actually cheaper. It's actually cheaper, you know, but people are getting rich off of the incarcerated right. population. Right, And, right. You, you know, so, yeah, Skid Row doesn't have to be like that. Um, all of it, it doesn't have to be like, if we cared about people. It's like, if you have the money to make your museum, then you mm-hmm. have, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean. There, you know, it's it's it, like that's always the like you know you got to put in money to raise awareness and to support, and and then and then there's money that could go into other things. So I I don't know the ins and outs of the politics of the organization. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I don't want to speak to that. I don't want to misspeak right, right, right. any of that. But it is you know because because then you know there's a lot of nonprofits and other social justice and uh, you know different types of organizations and yeah. you know they got to. Put money like we were talking about with, uh, uh, you know, marketing and promotion. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, it's like yeah, music yeah. videos and oh, all of no. that, all the 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 stuff where you got to advert. Oh, the uh, the mayor mayoral race. Right, right. You yeah, know, yeah. Like putting money into that because you got to spread the word because people don't know. You know. Well, I mean, I I saw Gavin Newsom mm-hmm. um, being interviewed by. I think it's being interviewed by somebody from Fox News. It wasn't. It was. Um, I want to say Tucker Carlson, but it's not Tucker Carlson. Mm-hmm. He he left Fox. Um, yeah. It was the other guy that's always on there. I can't remember his name. Um, but Gavin Newsom was like, "Yeah, um, we're we're the we're the fourth largest like economy. A- world. Econ- yeah, economy." Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Take that, Germany," and I was like. In California, we have more money than Germany. <laughs> yeah. How are there poor people here? Yeah, like you know, so that doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it doesn't make sense at all. So it's like, where's the money going? Like, yeah, where where, yeah. where and the are thing all these is, programs that we could pay for it's it's not museums like that taking the big bulk. Of right, the money, right, right. You know? No, no, it's not. Yeah. It's not it's the it's... bigger corporations and the banks and Walmart and you know. Like, oh man, I, I hate Walmart. Yeah, <laughs> I hate Walmart. I mean, we it, it it makes no sense for to have net profits of you know billions of dollars, but yet the people are subsidizing you know like welfare checks for mm-hmm. yeah the employees because you don't pay them enough. Like yeah. it doesn't it doesn't make any sense, and I don't understand like how they get away with it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. But like you said, it's policy. What the lady said is it's policy. Yeah. You know? So it's so how so how do we change the policy? Because it feels like, you know, when people go into office, they they say the right things, but once they get there, it's like how do you keep how do you keep um policyholders accountable once you put them in office? Yeah. Well I th- I think um well, you were talking about like if we can get money out of politics, that's a big step. Um, until we can do that, it's really like the the people in the community have to speak up and fight and be willing and not be complacent. Like we can't do the oh, I don't get into politics thing yeah, yeah. anymore. You know, but I, I mean, I don't even know if it's complacency because it's like you know. You got to work to survive out here. Yeah, I mean the amount the amount of time it would take to 
you know, protests and be at these meetings mm-hmm. and you know what I mean? I mean yeah. it's that that's a job in of itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's you can you can't ask, you know, a single mother of three to you know what I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> like be yeah. out there protesting, you know, every day, which you know, which is what it feels like it would it would take. Mm-hmm. You know? That's kind of difficult. It's like you, you're a slave to your bills, and yeah. you know you you kind of get in that rat race. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, how do how do you hold these people accountable when everybody's too busy? Mm-hmm. It seems like you know what I mean. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I I get that. I think um, you know becoming part of joining community organizations, so like everybody can. Even if you don't show up and protest and all that, at yeah. least if you're being educated around who's making what policies and how how is that affecting you and yeah and so you know like it's like a lot of a lot of organizations will do like their voter guide yeah you know and like even paying attention to that like Mm. you know like incrementally stuff helps yeah and we can't just rely on politicians and you know there's there's a lot because the, the whole system is like it's through every thread right which you know the racism classism ableism like all the isms sexism sexism all of it you know so so there's all these different layers and levels and so i think um you know from people i've talked to and my experiences and everything like the more that we can become part of communities Mm. and and in some way show up and be invested in each other yeah learn from each other yeah you know i think that's uh, an access to having things work better because mm-hmm. the more siloed off and I like, so in my conflict resolution work, mm-hmm. when I would go into organizations and I was like, this department doesn't talk to that department. These people don't talk to that people. And this, the, and, and like the, the people at the top are benefiting a lot of times. Right. Exactly. And, or, you know, the business could be suffering also, but right. at least they're okay. Yep. But it, once they start talking to each other, you see this in in uh, acad- academia a lot, where yeah. the staff is cut off from the faculty, mm. you know, who's cut off from the students, mm. you know. But it, but the more that they can work together, you know, and collaborate, you know, then things start happening at, in those organizations right. that benefit everybody. Right, right. You know, versus, well, you know, they got that and we didn't get this, and you know, but right. but then, but they're not talking. So. You know, taking it from like the micro to the macro, you know, I think I think we just like I mean, Nikki says this in the film also. Like we we have to talk to each other. Yeah. You know, and that's you know going back to policing, you, you know, it's like if we're not if we don't know our neighbors, if we're not talking to our neighbors, um, but you know, they're Gina says this in the film. You know, your trash can's in the wrong place. You call like nine one one. The cops show up. You know. <laughs> Like, like, like stuff like that. Right, right, right. You know? Yeah, no, um, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So, so it's all about building a community. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that's where it starts. And recognizing, and th- and that's at the core of, like everything that I do, like bringing people together and, yeah. and understanding, like we may have differences and different experiences, but at the end of the day, like we're in this together. Right. 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 And there's a. There's a when there's love and, and, and admiration and respect yeah. and, you know, an investment, like I care about you. Right. What happens right. to you? I care about what happens you know? to you. Right. Yeah. Right. Like that, that makes a difference. You know, that's so true. That's so true. So, um, where, where are you going next? Um, you know, for the, for the next couple, how, how long are you like, you doing this oh. kind of like tour thing? Yeah, I think, well, um, we're we're gonna be in uh, Montclair, New Jersey, on okay. July twelfth, and we have a amazing panel. Chuck Modi, who's a, a social justice journalist, is a part of the panel, and um, it's gonna be awesome. So we're, you know we're doing that July twelfth, uh, Skid Row Museum, August eighteenth, okay. uh, Sacramento at Cal- at um, uh, Sacramento State. On September twenty second, awesome. And then things are gonna, you know, get filled in in between. And then, um, like, we just were accepted to the Los Angeles Independent Film Festival. Okay. Coming up, and awesome. so, you know, I'm I'm willing to like be out on the road and and 
do you know do these panels and everything? This, this would be your tour instead of the yeah. music tour. This, yeah, this right. Going to be your tour. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's um, you know, I was telling a couple friends of mine. You know, it's uh, uh it's it's really moving and inspiring to see people come out and to have the conversations happen. Yeah, and it's a very different experience from you know promoting a horror film or a comedy or something like it's like yeah this is work it's important yeah. you know and it has and I want it to be done it has to be done but it's yeah. it, you know but it's also you know there's a bigger uh goal in mind right you know? right right um but it's yeah it's just it's a different <laughs> experience no nah, definitely yeah. definitely any any plans of going to like Atlanta or anything I'm working on it you know they're building Cop City out there yeah. and everything yeah I'm, so I'm, you know we Basically, like if people want to, you know, if you're interested in having uh, a screening in your area, you can reach me through the website, reimaginingsafetymovie.com. Okay. And that's how a lot of these screenings have come up. People will, you know, see an interview or they'll hear about the film, they'll go to the website. And it's like, oh, we want to have that, you know, here. Right, right, right. Um, we were talking to some Atlanta folks around the Stop Cop City uh, thing when they were when they were having the like the week of solidarity which okay. was back in February okay. and then you know things kept happening over yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah. they were busy and you know so it's like you know people pop up and it's like all right we're gonna do it here like the New Jersey thing came up like a couple weeks ago uh-huh. you know and Memphis like that was start to finish like we started talking and then three weeks later I was in Memphis oh wow um Sacramento's a little different like we've been talking about that for a while and they're okay. setting up a big thing so you know it it's it's uh the communities are requesting it nice. and I, I also reach out to people to let them know that the, the film is there I really uh going back to distribution yeah um my desire for this film is to be on uh an accessible platform where people can come to a screening and then tell their friends or their family, Oh, go watch this. Right. You know, right, or they'll right. go watch it and then they'll come to a panel discussion right, or something, right. but to really have it be accessible for people. I, I could, I could probably make, um, I don't know how you feel about, well, we'll, we'll talk about it. After. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to, don't nobody out there. You'd be like, hell no, I want that shit. <laughs> I ain't putting my movie there. <laughs> There's this thing called YouTube. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but nah, nah, I get you though. I mean, you don't you don't wanna just kind of throw it on YouTube. You mm-hmm. definitely want something to add to the Yeah. The and also, movie. you know, I have other um documentary work I wanna do. So, yeah. you know, if I can get my foot in with, you know, a larger uh platform. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like like PBS or right, right. you know Netflix or something, then it's like, yeah, okay, cool. Here's my my next thing. Exactly. Let's let's exactly. bring that in, you know. What um what other ideas do you have for future documentaries? I mean, you don't have to lay out everything. Yeah, I mean, you know? look, I I um one of the things that was really inspiring to me interviewing people is learning more about abolition and how abolition is really about if we care, you know, when we care about each other, yeah, we make policy that supports each other. Right, right. You know, so I would love to look at, like, if we really cared about each other, how would we approach education mm. and government and uh, climate and, mm. you know, things like that through the lens of, you know, you know, care for one another. So that's, that's, so do you feel like with the policies we have now that we don't care about each other? I th- I think the majority is uh uh economic driven. You know. So it's not community driven. It's not No, I mean some of it is yeah. for sure, but it's really hard that's a hard sell right now because people are so like I was saying more individualistic yeah, and yeah. You know, I got to get mine. And, right, right. You know, I want you to have yours, but if it takes away from me, right, then I don't right, want right. it. You, you know, so I, I, I know that there, I mean, there are people out there working really hard for uh, community-based policies. Yeah. And there are policies, you, you know, um, that are effective that way. Right. It just, it just it's, it's hard in the system we're in, the capitalism, the system of capitalism, where, you know, the the richer keep getting rich the rich keep getting richer right 
you know, and everybody else struggles more and more. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, why don't we have, why doesn't everybody have health care? Right. You know, like, free health care. Right. You know? Um, I went to, I did a um, documentary in um, Eritrea, mm-hmm. um, in Africa. It's in, like, the um, northeast coast of Africa, right off the Red Sea. Um, and the country has pretty much been in war for the past... 50, 60 years, you know, with um, a neighboring African country and with um, outside forces as well. Um, They've probably been war-free for, like, the last 10 years, I think it is. Um, But every every person in the country gets a free education, free college, and free health care. Yeah. And I'm like... This, I mean, this country is ten years free from war. I mean, they have so many development issues yeah. that they're still trying to work through. And, but the first thing they did was gave people free education. They built schools, and they built hospitals. Mm-hmm. Free education and free health care. Yeah. It's like there's no excuse on why we shouldn't yeah. have. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. When when we wanted to go to the moon. Like, we invested in education. Yeah. And it was like, we need to beat the Russians. <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, everybody's right. going to college, you know. Um, yeah. When we, when we invest in the people, you know, progress right, happens. Right. You know, people are taken care of. People are better off. Right, you know? right. So. What, um, so, we're in, we're in a capitalistic society. What would you think would be the ideal system for the United States? Yeah, that's a tough one. That's something that, you know, it's easy to to point to communism and Marxism. Yeah. You know, and and those are things that I'm learning more and more. Right, about. right, right, you right. Know, I know that the, I know that profits over people doesn't work. Mm. You know, I I know that when people have resources, they're better off. Yeah. So you know, I I'm not at a place where I feel confident enough to, right, you know, right, to speak on, right. on what the economic system would be, but yeah. that at its core, you know, um, like even, you know, a lot of, a lot of activists in, in social justice, you know, consider themselves Marxists yeah, or say yeah. that they're Marxists. And so, you know, and I've read, um, uh, uh, Shoot, what's his name? Marx, <laughs> of course. Marx. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've read, I've read his, you know, and, and, uh, you know, at its core, what it what it stands for, you know, classless society, you know, yeah. everybody, you know, contributes and is part of the whole, like, that makes sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it's really hard after, you know, thousands of years, I get it. Right, to right. To shift, it, especially when communism has been so demonized in our culture, you know? <laughs> Goddamn commies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the commies are like, you know, capitalist pigs. <laughs> <laughs> like, I grew up on all the 80s. Yeah, movies, yeah, like Schwarzenegger yeah. films and, you know, Rambo and, like, all of that. Man, that's, that's crazy because it is in the films. Like, it's, oh. wow. Damn, man. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a plan. It's, mm-hmm. It is a plan. Um. I mean, from what from what I see, like you could still have a capitalistic. Maybe I'm being naive, but it seems like you could still have a capitalistic society. Like if we wanted to implement like everything we wanted to implement, you could still have capitalism. That's what it seems like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But like when you're giving tax loopholes to you know billionaire corporations and they're not paying into the taxes the the fun for everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it seems like it could, like, what we're doing could work. It's just you can't keep giving loopholes to, mm-hmm. you know, the biggest contributors to our tax system. It, it seems like you could give everybody free education, give yeah. everybody free health care. It's like it could be paid for. It could be done. Mm-hmm. And you could still have your capitalistic society. Now, you might go from $300 billion to... You know, a hundred and fifty billion, but you know, there's nothing that you really can't like. Like, there's there's really no difference. Yeah. You still have the same lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know how, what I mean? How much money 
does somebody actually need? Right, right. You know, to even live like a billionaire. Right, right. right. You could still do do that. Like you, you could know. you could be a billionaire and not spend your billion in a lifetime, and it could last for generation to generation. Yeah, you know what I mean. It it, it doesn't make sense why. Uh, yeah, it's 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 frustrating. Mm-hmm. It is frustrating. Wow. Okay. And it's a choice. You yeah. Know, like people could choose to invest in housing people. Right. You know? R- Rick Caruso could have invested that hundred million or fifty million. You know, into. Hey, you would have got the votes. Them. I would have voted for your ass. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, instead of yeah, you know, vote me in and then and then I'll ship everybody off to, you know, Lancaster or something, which is what he was saying. Right. You know? Right. Um Well, you know that's what they do, right? Yeah. They um like I had um a re- a really good friend of mine, he used to work for a city and um I asked him about cuz this was like a couple years ago, like we was really seeing like, yeah, there's a lot of homeless population is really going up. And um, I asked him, I was like, you know, like, what do you guys do? Like, can you make homes? He was like, man, every city, he said, every city has the money to make, like, affordable housing for the homeless. I said, every city? He said, every city has the money for it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you just have to find the land and property and you got to do it. He was like, but no city wants to be the first to do it. Mm -hmm. Because then all the homeless people would come to their city and, you know what I'm saying? To, to to house him and I was like really he was like yeah I was like so what you just let the people he was like man <laughs> he said it's messed up he said what we do is you know when we want to get them out of our city we'll put them in a van we'll take them to a neighboring city take them to Denny's mm-hmm. and leave them there yeah that happened in uh Beverly Hills they took everybody down to I think it was Malibu or Venice Beach or something Really? Yeah. That's insane, yeah. man. How can you treat people? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then and then, you know, the, like when when people want to build housing, uh you know, then the people who are living in those communities like the not in my backyard. Right, so, right, right. You know, cuz it cuz like everybody's been demonized and othered, you know. Yeah. So it's like, well, I don't want those people right, living right. next to me. It's well, like, they they should have housing. I just don't want to. Yeah, hear. just yeah. not here. Dude, right. Over there is fine. <laughs> just take them over there, you know. And and yeah, like it. It's um. But that's what you said. Like, there's there's no there's no us. There's no community. Yeah. There's no. It's all about me. I got my family. That's and, you know that that's where it stops. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Really got to change the mindset, mm-hmm. you know. That's that's what's first got to change, yeah. you know. That's crazy, Matthew. If the people want to find you, yeah, um, they want to get in contact with you, um, they want to hold um, a screening yeah. um, at their place. Where can the people find you? Yeah, it's uh, reimagining safety dot com is the website, and then our Instagram is reimagining safety movie. So either of those places and uh, you know, because we're like working on distribution, like yeah. a big part of that is showing that there's numbers and interest. And so if you follow either, you know, the website or the, or the Instagram, it, it, it helps also. We don't, we don't spam, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll send out a thing, you know, we're doing screenings here and here and here, but yeah, like, and follow and all of that. Reimagining safety movie. Awesome. 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 Um, Matthew, thank you for coming yeah, in thank today, you. man. We appreciate it. Um, this has been an insightful conversation and um, really happy about the work that you're doing, man. And I hope you can continue with it. Um, keep doing your thing, man. It's, 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 it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, let's get Matthew more funding so he can make more cool documentaries, more informative documentaries. Um, this is the Beyond Take Two podcast brought to you by Beyond Hollywood International Film Festival. And we just completed episode 23. Um, with the great Matthew Solomon. I want to thank him again for coming through. Thank you guys, uh, whether you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or watching this on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up. Um, Hit our subscribe button. Uh, Let those algorithms know that this is the type of content that you want to continue seeing. 
Um, we are taking next week off. Uh, we hope everybody has a happy 4th of July. Matthew, anything that you want to say to the people before we go? No, thank you for watching. <laughs> Indeed. And thanks for uh, having me. Oh, man, it's no problem at all. We appreciate you being here. Um, we will see you guys in two weeks. All right? Peace. Beyond Take Two, take a walk beyond Hollywood, beyond the lights, camera, action, is the hard work and passion. Beyond Take Two, take a walk beyond Hollywood, beyond the lights, camera, action, is the hard work and passion.